In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, our Lord, how admirable is thy name in the whole earth, for thy magnificence is elevated above the heavens. These are the words of today's gradual that were chanted after the reading of the epistle. And they speak to us of the wonder and the glory of God. How admirable is his name in all the earth. And if you can look out upon the whole of creation, you can see why the psalmist says these words. Why praise the Lord who made this world. When you look out, you see why. You see a beautiful, wonderful creation. But if this is how beautiful the old creation is, how much more beautiful is the new creation? The new creation, which is the church. Both here on earth, the church militant, and of course, even more glorious, the church in paradise. I remember early in the pontificate of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, he said a very beautiful thing about the church. It's one of the most beautiful descriptions. He said the church is a field hospital. And this is one of those statements that can be overlooked unless we really understand what it means. Part of the glory and the wonder that God has given to the church is that not only is she beautiful, but she is also a field hospital. Now, a field hospital has a purpose. It has a mission. The mission of a hospital is to cure those who are sick. To take care of the wounded, the sick, the suffering. And that is the mission of the church. But although a field hospital cares for the physical illness that a person has, or physical injury, the field hospital of the church cares for the injury to the soul, that sickness in the soul which we know as sin. And so our Holy Father's words are very strong to us today that the very mission of the church is that she is an instrument in the world for the healing of the sin-sick soul. That part of God's wonderful plan in the creation of his new creation, the church, is that she would be that field hospital for sinners. That the great work of the church would be to free the world from sin. To purge from it all that sickness of the soul. And to make the soul whole and healthy again. To heal the soul. That the soul may be holy in God's sight. And so it's part of the very mission of the church. In fact, you might say it's the very foundation of the mission of the church to address sin and to bring about that healing from sin which God desires. And that is really what our Holy Gospel today speaks about. We hear two powerful scenes as our Lord draws close to Jerusalem. The first is that when our Lord drew near to Jerusalem, When he saw the city on his approach, he wept over the city. This is one of the few times in the gospel where it describes our Lord weeping. Why is he weeping over the city Jerusalem? He's weeping because the city Jerusalem did not know the time of its visitation. The time when the Lord would visit it. And the people within the city were ignorant that the Lord himself was coming to them. Less than 40 years later, Jerusalem would be destroyed. The temple would be demolished. And what our Lord is saying is that they should have known the time of the visitation. He's weeping for the city because of how much he loves Jerusalem. And how much he is saddened that because Jerusalem did not recognize the Lord, she would suffer horribly in 40 years' time. And then our Lord goes into Jerusalem. And he goes to the temple. The very first thing he does when he comes to the city that he loves is he goes straight to the temple and he begins to cast out all the money changers who were selling there. He drives them out and says, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. 
These are the two actions that our Lord does. First, he weeps over the city because the city is unaware that salvation has come and the city is not repenting and turning towards the Lord. And then second, he goes in and he drives out sin at the very heart of the city in the temple itself. And we see in this moment our Lord's deep compassion and his zeal. And of course, he had this for Jerusalem, but this is also meant to be a sign for us of the way he approaches us. He comes to each one of us. And when he sees that we hold on to sin, when he sees the sin that's in our soul that turns us away from God, he weeps. Because if we do not repent, we will face destruction just like Jerusalem did. Our Lord is weeping because he wants us to receive the healing of our soul. He has that deep compassion that drives him even to tears. Tears because he wants us to be healed. And yet so often we refuse to let him. And then the second action. He comes into our soul and he drives out the sin with zeal. His zeal, his righteous anger against sin is seen in the scene in which he goes and with his own body drives out the money changers. That should be a powerful image for each one of us. Christ wants to do the same thing in each of our souls. He wants to drive out the money changers in our heart. He wants to purge us from all sin. He wants to heal us. Because he says of each one of us, my house is the house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. Each one of us, because of our sin, has made our souls a den of thieves when it was meant from all eternity to be his house of prayer. And he wants to come in and heal us and restore us to be that house of prayer, to be holy and spotless in his sight. And so this is the purpose of the church. The church is the gift of of Christ to the world, a gift of a Christ weeping for the salvation of the world. And in it, it contains that zeal of Christ to bring healing to each one of us. And the church has that healing. There is healing for our sins found in the church. But we need to use those graces that the church gives us, those graces which God intended for each one of us and entrusted to the church, that we might find that healing, that we might draw close to God and be reconciled to Him and find healing for our souls. And just as you might go to a doctor and have an appointment with a doctor and sit down and find out that for your disease, you need to do several things. So we can think of the several steps that each one of us needs to do to heal our souls from sin. Recognizing in this moment the tears of Christ that he is shedding for us because of our sin and his zeal to to cast that sin out of our soul. And so just as we do with our normal health, we can think of two steps. First, prevention. Those things in which we can do to stop our soul from receiving sin in the first place. We can stop us from sinning. And then second, dealing with the consequences of sin healing once we have committed a sin. That is why in our epistle today, St. Paul speaks to us very directly about the nature of sin. He's trying to teach us to to be cautious. He's trying to teach us to avoid that near occasion of sin. This is prevention. He says to us that we should not covet evil things, that we should not be idolaters, We should not commit fornication. We should not tempt Christ. We should not murmur. What he's saying here is not merely not to do the sin itself. That's obvious. But that we should have an eye towards avoiding even the temptation of sin. That's what he means when he says that let us not, we should not tempt Christ himself. You can think of people who play near the edge of a cliff. 
It's only a short matter of time before one of them falls over. And so we have a choice in our lives. We can choose to walk by the edge of the cliff, knowing that if we fall over, it's not going to be pretty. Or we can choose, knowing the danger of the cliff, to avoid it and to go far away. Sometimes today there's this temptation that says, I've got it. I don't need to worry about sin as much. I can go close to sin and be fine. We see this when it comes to idolatry, as St. Paul mentioned. We think, okay, money, I can love money. I can devote my life to money. It won't become my God. How quickly we come near to the edge of that cliff. How quickly we fall over. The love of money is the root of all evil, our Lord says. And we need to take caution that money doesn't create the situation for sin. A comfortable life is an easy place to find many temptations. Remember that it was money changers that our Lord chased out of the temple, not prostitutes or murderers or thieves. In our world today, we live in a, in a society focused on materialism and material goods. And while money is not a bad thing in and of itself, we need to be cautious of that love of money, that pursuit of money, which creates too convenient or comfortable a life, which is like placing your house on the edge of a cliff. Instead, we need to be zealous like our Lord was to chase out those money changers in our hearts, to devote that money to other things than our own pleasure, and to seek after Christ first and foremost. And then St. Paul speaks about fornication. Of course, in this, he's speaking about all kinds of lust. And our society today is filled with this temptation. We need to be prudent. We need to have that zeal that Christ had, to say, I'm not going to go near the edge. I'm going to try to keep my mind as pure as possible. I'm not going to put myself in a situation that puts me close to temptation. If a young man or a young woman are dating or, or courting, preparing for marriage, they need to have clear boundaries in their relationship because temptation comes quickly. We shouldn't be playing by the edge of a cliff. We need to put safeguards on our computers and our other devices. And we need to put strong accountability in our life so that what we see online is pure. This is one of the fastest growing temptations in our world today. We need to purify our computers and put safeguards there. We should not be playing near the edge of the cliff. And yes, that means we might miss out on certain things. Maybe there's certain TV shows that we need to stop watching. Maybe there's certain freedom that we have in our life with our internet use that we need to avoid. But remember the zeal of Christ and the tears of Christ. And then St. Paul also speaks of murmuring. And here we can see all kinds of sins that we commit with our mouths, with our tongues. When we speak ill words about someone else, when we gossip, when we complain, when we don't need to be, we need to also avoid these sins. We need to have that zeal of Christ. If we gossip about something, we destroy the reputation of someone, and it's as significant as stealing from that person. When we spend all our day complaining, not only do we corrupt our own soul, but we hurt the souls of others, because we tear down their lives as well. We break apart their peace. We hurt their ability to follow Christ in gentle peace. Prevention is a key part of the Christian life. Avoiding that near temptation of sin. Not walking about mindlessly, but thinking about how, in what ways, we can avoid sin itself. So that's the first part of using the field hospital of the church to avoid sin. And the second part is what happens when we do sin. And this, then, is the process of healing our soul. Sin has two consequences. 
It separates us from God and it wounds our soul so that our soul is not able to love as completely as it's meant to. And so we need to do two things to heal the soul. And they're both found when we go to confession. That's why going to confession often is such an important part of the Christian life. In the traditional form of the sacrament, there were two concluding prayers that finished the sacrament of penance, of confession. The first is retained in the newer form of the, of the sacrament. And it's the formula of absolution. And in that moment, we are absolved from our sins. That's that first consequence of sin. We are now reconciled with God. We're no longer separated from God because of our sin. But then a second prayer was said, and while it's still an option in the newer form, it was always said in the older form of the sacrament. And the prayer says this, May the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merits of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and of all the saints, whatever good you have done, and whatever evil you have endured, achieve for you the forgiveness of your sins, the increase of grace, and the rewards of everlasting life. What a beautiful prayer. What's being asked for in this prayer is that our penance would heal our soul. But listen to the way it says it. First of all, it asks that the passion of our Lord would be applied to heal our soul. Because it was on the cross that he won for us salvation. Not only reunion with God, but also the healing of our soul that we would be able to love. And then also the prayer asks that the merits of the Blessed Virgin and of all the saints be applied to us as well. Because their merits win for us also that healing of our soul. But then it turns to the penitent himself. It turns to the person who has just been forgiven of sins. Whatever good you have done and whatever evil you have endured, that's how we heal the soul. When we do good and when we endure evil patiently, the soul is being healed. We've been reconciled already. That's the words of absolution. But now we need to begin the process of healing the soul that has been wounded because of sin. And it accomplishes in us three things, the prayer says. First, the forgiveness of our sins. Then the increase of grace. And finally, the reward of everlasting life. That's why a priest gives you a penance to do in each confession. Because it's not only the words of absolution that you need that reconciles you with God. That's the first thing it heals you of. We also need to heal our wounded soul so that we are able to love as we were intended to. We need to have our soul healed. And penance does that. The works of penance, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, are like medicines for our soul. They help, help to heal that selfishness, that pride, lust, greed, and all the other vices within us. That's why a priest gives you these penances, but that's only the beginning. It's like a doctor handing you the first installment of a medicine and saying, take this. And then going home, you also need to continue to take the medicine to continue to heal yourself. We need that healing. We need to heal our souls by doing penance. The sacrament of penance, the sacrament of confession, is not only a one-time event. It's obviously that as well. But it calls us to a life of penance. The Christian life is a sharing in the cross of Christ, which heals our soul. And each of us is called to live out that penance in our own lives. It's particularly on Fridays, but even beyond that as well. We can ask ourselves, how am, I, how am I going to imitate the zeal of Christ? How am I going to imitate the zeal of Christ when he cast out the money changers from the temple? How am I going to live up to his tears that he wept for me? I need to take the healing medicine of the church seriously. I need to work on that prevention. I need to sit down and examine my life and say, okay, Lord, 
what areas do I need to avoid that cliff so I don't even go near sin? And then I need to work on healing the sin I've already done. I need to go to confession frequently. I need to receive that absolution that reunites me with the mercy and love of God. And then I need to do penance. First of all, the penance the priest gives me. But then more than that. I need to do those works of penance, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, as medicine for my soul. And in doing so, I will discover that my soul learns to love in a more beautiful way. When I pray, I fast, and I give alms more frequently, my soul learns what it was made to do. It learns that love, which is the very purpose of my soul. Beloved, we were made to have souls in love with God. We were made to be perfect and holy in His sight. That is why Christ came. That is why He endured every suffering and passion that He did. That is why when He drew near to Jerusalem and when He draws near to our souls, He weeps when He sees the sin that separates us from God. And that is why when He comes into our souls, He is zealous to cast out every last money changer within, every last vice, every last sin. Because He wants us for Himself. He wants us for paradise. Beloved, in a few minutes more, upon this altar, our Lord will come. What are the sins that He is weeping at in your life? What are the things you need to give up? The preventions you need to take? And when you receive Him in Holy Communion, when He rests upon your tongue, what money changers will He drive from your heart? Let us be zealous like Him. Let us embrace the penitential life that heals our souls. And so let us make the church our field hospital where we come as sick sinners receiving his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, and his healing. And so as the field hospital of the church, we may be healed and we may be sanctified and in the end, we may become saints in paradise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Ecce agnus Dei, ecce qui tolis peccata mundi, domin non sunt dignus, lucincium de tectum meum, sectantum de verbum, et senabitur animum meum. Domin non sunt dignus, lucincius de tectum meum.